Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa la'udwana illa ala al-zalameen. Wa la'aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala anihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. So as many of you know, I, just this morning I was eating the pepper in Trinidad. And I just flew direct. Who would have thought there's a direct flight from Trinidad to Toronto? Alhamdulillah. So I managed to make it here this morning from Trinidad. Now the disadvantage of that is that I haven't heard the previous lectures. So you might hear the exact same thing over and over again. I might be repetitive, but I hope you guys will ex excuse me if I do repeat something that you've already heard, inshallah ta'ala. But at the same time, hopefully a different perspective uh, will allow us all to reflect on something greater. You know, a lot of times when we talk about the Qur'an and one of the greatest tragedies that we have is not just a disconnect with the Qur'an, it's a disconnect between Muslim youth in, and Islam and Muslims as a whole and Islam and finding true spiritual fulfillments from their religion. So whether it's in the form of Salah and the prayer, whether it's from the Qur'an, whether it's from the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, I'm not feeling fulfilled from this. And there are many things that we can go into for that, you know, uh, to help correct that. But in particular, when we're talking about the Quran, you know, I want to give you guys a story. Um, it's a very beautiful story from Umar bin Al-Khattab radiAllahu taala anhu that would help us understand what it means to be a walking Quran. And hopefully, we can take from that something very special about how it affects an entire society. One time, Umar bin Al-Khattab radiAllahu taala anhu met a caravan that was coming through Al Madina to make Umrah. And whenever he saw this caravan, they were coming in at night. Obviously at that time you couldn't see the faces at night. Just like I can't see any of you right now. I just see this huge bright light uh, shining in my face. I can't see anyone's faces. But Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu couldn't see anybody. So he asks these people. He says, where are you coming from? And they say, we're coming from Fajjin Amiq from a deep valley. And where are you headed to? They said, we're headed to Al-Bayt Al-Atiq, to the sacred home, speaking about the Kaaba. And Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, he told some of his companions, he said, they have, some, they have someone amongst them that's teaching them Qur'an. There's something about these people that distinguishes them with the Qur'an. So he asked them, Ayyul Qur'ani a'zam. What is the greatest part of the Qur'an? And they said, Allahu la ilaha illa hu al hayyul qayyum. Ayatul kursi. They responded that with that. And he said, and which part of the Qur'an, which ayah of the Qur'an gives the greatest hope? And they responded, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَثُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ The ayah from Surah Al-Zumar. That say, O oh my servants who have despaired, who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins. Inna huwa al ghafur rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all forgiving, most merciful. So then he said, And which of the ayat of the Quran is most decisive concerning justice? And they responded, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you with justice and compassion. Allah commands you with justice and compassion, enjoins you with justice and compassion. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu responded and he said, Afikum Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Do you have Abdullah ibn Mas'ud amongst you? And they said, Yes. He said, I knew it. <laughs> So he went and he found Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And you can imagine, by the way, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu was so big, physically speaking, that when, when he would ride an animal, his feet would touch the ground. So he was huge. Okay? He was the, the Sahaba version of Paul Bunyan. Humongous physically, and subhanAllah, he is Al Faruq. He's Al Ladi Yufariqu Bain al Haqi wal Batil, the one who distinguishes between truth and falsehood. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu on the other hand is someone who from a physical standpoint is a dwarf but of course the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that on the day of judgment each one of his legs would be the size of Uhud, Mount Uhud. 
And the Prophet and, and Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu finds Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and he's so excited that he takes him from the caravan, he goes and he sits with him on the side and you can imagine the difference in size. And he speaks with him and listens to him and then at the end he comes out and he says, Kunayifun Muli'a ilma. He's like a pot that's full of knowledge. He's small in size but subhanAllah he's full of the Qur'an. And you know what makes this story so amazing to me is that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu being the one who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man arada an yasma' al-Qur'an whoever wants to hear the Qur'an ghadlan, tariyan, kama unzil fresh as if it was just being revealed let him listen to the qira'ah of Ibn Umm Abd Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu the fact that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu recognized that because an entire group of people became inspired with the Qur'an that they had to have Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu amongst them, they had to have a scholar of Qur'an amongst them, tells you a lot. It shows you that Allah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, tells us many times in the Qur'an, thematically, but of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the condition of a people until they change the condition of themselves, they change that which is within themselves. This one person had that entire impact on a society. In fact, when Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu sent him to Kufa, the entire city of Kufa became known as Medina al Quran, the city of Quran. Most of the scholars of Quran would come from that city because of one man. Dear brothers and sisters, what we have right now, what we suffer from is many people feel that disconnect from the Qur'an and because of that the entire society does not trust the Qur'an for its solutions. And it's no secret that when we look to the societies in the Middle East today, in the Muslim world today, we find that there is a mistrust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a mistrust of the Qur'an. There is a hesitation with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's a great tragedy. Because when we express to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّا وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ نَبِيًّا وَرَسُولًا That I am pleased with Allah as my Lord. I am pleased with Muhammad, with Islam as my religion. I am pleased with Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم as my Prophet and Messenger. That pleasure, that expression of rida also expresses a sense of trust. And so when we talk about the Qur'an in particular, and we always talk about it being shifa'un ima fi sudur being a cure for the ailments of the hearts, being a cure for society, being a guidance to mankind. But at the same time, I don't really trust the Qur'an. I don't really, you know, I don't go to it as a book of guidance. I go to it as a book of healing, a book of songs, a book of inspiration. I almost treat it like a book of fiction. And some people do that, don't they? It's almost like a book of fiction. You know, I'm not really too sure about these stories. But at the same time, they're really nice to read and really nice to enjoy. But when something happens to me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the story of Yusuf alayhi salam to go and reflect upon, and these are not fictional characters, then it, it's supposed to create a greater understanding for us. It's supposed to allow us to bear the tests that we face in our lives. And you know, one of the greatest problems we have is that when we read the Qur'an, we read it just as that. Again, that book of stories, that book of fiction. And that's a great misunderstanding on our part. In fact, I'll just tell you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispels that with one ayah in the Qur'an. The second ayah of Surah Maryam. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kaf ha ya ain sad. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? ذِكْرُ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّكَ عَبْدَهُ This is a mention of the mercy of your Lord to His servants. You see that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Your Lord, رَبِّكَ عَبْدَهُ His servant. Why? Because if you're going to open Surah Maryam and you're going to start reading it, and automatically you have that notion that you know what? Zakariya alayhi salam is a special situation. You know, the prophets that we're about to read about and the amazing things that happened to them, this is, an, this is an exception. That's something that used to happen back in the day, it doesn't happen anymore. You know, and one of, one of the great scholars, Imam al-Qushayri rahimahullah ta'ala, he commented on that. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped his destruction of a people as a whole. Allah azawajal no longer would send adab that would wipe out a people. 
That's something that stopped with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, the miracles that come from His mercy would continue, would continue until the end of time. Allah Azza wants you to read the story of Zakaria alayhi salam and understand that if you call upon him with that same level of trust and conviction and confidence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do the same thing for you. That if you have the same level of tawakkul, of trust that Maryam alayhi salam had when she called upon her Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would defend you too. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would honor you even when you felt like you were going to be humiliated too. If you had the same love the same humility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Isa alayhi salam had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would honor you too. If you addressed your parents with the sincerity that Ibrahim alayhi salam addressed his father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would replace that void of emotional comfort and support from the family with someone else. Allah azza wa doesn't want you to read it and say, yeah, that used to happen back in the day. That's awesome. That's amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, Rabbika, your Lord, his servant. Not Rabbahu, not his Lord, his servant. And so it goes back to us. And I'm sure I'm 100, actually I'm going to ask, let me cover the light right quick. Has anyone, already, I'm sure someone's already talked about, Right? The locks on the hearts? No? Really? Wow. I wasn't expecting that one. Okay. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'm not actually going to talk about that ayah to be honest with you. I'll just touch upon it because it hasn't been touched upon yet apparently. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do they fail, do they not contemplate the Qur'an or do they have locks on their hearts? Now those locks, what do they represent? You guys can tell me because you probably heard it in another lecture. What are those locks representing? Somebody tell me. Not the shaykhs. Somebody? I see you now. Anybody? What do they represent? Guidance doesn't go through. Why? What are the locks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about? Sins, right? The sins that prevent our hearts from benefiting from that guidance. Come on, you guys knew that. You didn't know that. Okay. When Mujahid rahimahullah, the great Mufassir of Quran, he explained it this way. He said that the Quran, he said that your heart is like an open hand. Whenever you sin once, this happens. Another time, this happens. Another time, this happens, this happens, this happens, until your heart becomes locked. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seals the heart. Notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about reflection on the Qur'an, the ability to reflect on the Qur'an, the ability to contemplate the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, أَفَلَا يَقْرَؤُونَ Quran? Do they not read the Qur'an? Or do they have locks on their hearts? You know why? Because if you can't even bring yourself to read the Qur'an, your heart is not just locked, it's dead. It needs complete revival. It needs to be completely brought back to life. But in order to draw from the Qur'an, to make it a source of inspiration for you, you have to remove those locks. And you know what I would argue that the greatest locks in our day and age are? They're intellectual locks. Seriously. They're intellectual locks because we have, we've become so accustomed to actually taking apart the Qur'an and deciding to agree and disagree with certain parts of it that the Qur'an no longer is going to be that book of inspiration for us. And this is, by the way, this is the stages through which Bani Israel went through. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about them in Surah Al-Baqarah. First and foremost, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِي from them are illiterate people. They don't know from the book except for wishful thinking. Yeah, that's in the Qur'an. Isn't that in the Qur'an? That's in the Qur'an. They make it all wishful thinking. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in one part of the book and disbelieve in another part of the book? So that's, this is by the way, according to some of the ulama, التدرج بالكفر the stages that they went through to their complete disbelief. Number one, it started off as neglecting the book to where it was just wishful thinking. Number two, I believe in some parts and I disbelieve in other parts. Number three, نَبَذَ فَرِيقٌ مِّنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِهِمْ كَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ They threw the book behind their backs as if they didn't even know. Complete 
disregard. Now let's go to those intellectual locks though. And there's a very beautiful dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. One of the duas that the Prophet ﷺ taught us whenever we are facing sorrow and distress. And the Prophet ﷺ said that this dua in particular is a source of, of, of stress relief. It's a way of getting rid of depression. It's a way of bringing about happiness in our lives. When we say, Allahumma inni abduk. Listen to this. Oh Allah, I am your slave. Ibn Abduk, Ibn Abduk, I am, the sl I am the son of your slave, Ibn Amatik. I am the son of my mother who is also a slave. Nasiyati biyadik, maadun fiya hukmuk, adlun fiya qadauk. SubhanAllah, these are very hard things to translate. I was sitting there trying to look through. You know, the first part of this, of this dua is very easy to translate. But I was trying to sit there and look through the different words of translation. So obviously the beginning of it, Oh Allah, I am your, I am your slave. Ibn Abduk, I am the, uh, the son of your slave. The son of my mother who is also your slave. Nasiyati biyadik. And you know, I was looking through the different translations. And it literally would mean that my forehead is in your hand. My forehead is in your hand. Which means that I am under your complete control. But not only that, it's not that I'm under your complete control and I'm calling upon you because I have to. I'm calling upon you because I've been forced to, because love cannot be imposed. And it's not because I don't trust you and I have no choice. No. Then you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your judgment upon me is assured. Your judgment upon me is assured. Mab. You are saying that it is already happening. Your judgment upon me is ensured. And your qada, your decree concerning me is just. You know the number one reason why people can't benefit from the Qur'an? Because they don't trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how are they going to trust the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whenever you are not looking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying that His qada with you, His decree with you, is, is, is not just with you, and you have that accusation towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how come I never got a fair shot at life, and then let me go read the Qur'an so it can make me feel better, you're missing the point. This is all before you can even approach the Qur'an properly. And so you say, مَاضٌ فِيَّ حُكْمُكْ عَدْلٌ فِيَّ قَضَاءُكْ And then you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Him, أَسْأَلُكَ I'm asking you, by every single one of your names. أَسْأَلُكَ بِكُلِّ اسْمٍ هُوَ لَكَ سَمَّيْتَ بِهِ نَفْسَكَ You named yourself with that name. Or maybe you taught one of your servants that name. Or maybe you hid that name with you in the unseen. Or maybe you revealed that name in the script. Maybe you actually revealed that name to us. I'm asking you by all of those names. أَن تَجْعَلَ الْقُرْآنَ رَبِيعَ قَلْبِي وَنُورَ صَدْرِي SubhanAllah, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're saying, I'm removing those locks, I'm removing the mistrust, I'm removing all of those sins, I'm removing all of those barriers between me and you. And I'm asking you, O oh Allah, to make the Qur'an the spring of my heart. وَنُورَ sadri, And the light of my chest. And the banisher of my sadness. And you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it the reliever of your distress. SubhanAllah. Before you can even ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Qur'an all of those things for you, where is your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You have to submit your head, your brain, submit your heart, submit your intellect, submit it all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And say, I trust you. Now make the Qur'an the reliever of my distress. Now make the Qur'an the spring of my heart. Now make the Qur'an the light of my chest. Otherwise, when you're approaching it, it's just like if you opened a book of fiction, that had a really, really sad story in it whenever you were going through your own distress. You know, it, it might work once or twice, but it's not really going to work if you believe that the characters are fictional. And if you believe that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you is not truly real. So it reflects that trust that we're supposed to have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what makes the Sahaba so amazing is that not only did they read the Qur'an much, not only did they educate the societies around them with Qur'an, Whenever something happened to them, these people who were scholars of the recitation of the Qur'an, the tafsir of the Qur'an, the translations of the Qur'an throughout the world, when something happened to them, they immediately went back to the Qur'an. 
Because it was a part of their everyday lives. And so you find Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who when he walks in, when he comes back to his city, they tell him that your son has passed away. You know what he does? Immediately he takes to the side and he prays two rak'ahs. I mean, this is devastating news. Your son is dead. And the first thing he does is he pulls himself to the side and he prays two rak'ahs. And when he finishes praying two rak'ahs, he says, فَعَلْنَا مَا أَمَرَنَا رَبُّنَا فَعَلْنَا مَا أَمَرَنَا رَبُّنَا We did what our Lord commanded us to do. وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And give glad tidings to the patients. SubhanAllah, you see that? He automatically went back to the Qur'an. We did what Allah commanded us to do and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And give glad tidings to the patient. Right away, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ and then he went, you know, he, he expressed that he's returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, that's a sense of trust. And you know what's amazing? When something good happens to us, what are we supposed to say? Alhamdulillah. That's from the Quran. And when something bad happens to us, what are we supposed to say? Inna lillah wa inna That to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we belong and to Him we return. These are Quranic phrases. These are things that come from the Quran. And both of them are expressions of trust. Both of them are expressions of confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it's in ease or whether it is in hardship, you never lose trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when you approach the Qur'an, those words come to you as words of comfort because you recognize that this is a personalized letter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. Allah Azza wa does not want you to read the Qur'an as if it was just revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you are reading about, you are reading the conversation, the transcript of the conversation between Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wants you to read it as if it was revealed to you. He wants you to read it as if this is a personalized letter from Allah to you. You know when you miss someone, you read their words, you can't wait to see someone, you keep reading those text messages, you read those emails. You know, this is Allah's words. And so you go to that and you're comforted. And you know, Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad rahimahullah ta'ala, listen to what he said. He said that when I feel distress, when I feel distress, and I open the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't have to come to an ayah that addresses distress in order for the distress to be removed, because just reading the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough of a reliever. Just saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm about, I have something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just reading the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough to do away with it. And then when you come to the ayat about distress, then it's a, a, a form of reassurance. And you know, I want to tell you guys a story because we, we draw inspiration from the Qur'an, particularly in the times of distress. Shifa'un imat al sudur It is a cure for that which is in the chest. This is a story that takes place involving three companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, and Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu. And this is an authentic narration. Umar is the Khalifa. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu walks by Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu one day and he says, Salaamu alaykum. And Uthman didn't answer him. So Sa'd was like, what's that all about? I just said, Salaamu alaykum to Uthman ibn Affan and he didn't even answer me. So he goes to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he asks him, he says, has anything changed in Islam? Is there any change in legis... Did something happen? You know, concerning the salam, the greeting? And he said, no. He said, well, why would you even ask that? He said, because I said, salamu alaykum to Uthman and he didn't even answer me. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, let's go talk to Uthman and see why he didn't answer you. So they go to Uthman and I want you to imagine these three people are people that are from the ten guaranteed paradise. And Sa'ad is with Umar, and Umar says to Uthman, why didn't you say wa alaykum as to Sa'ad when he gave you salam? Uthman said, what are you talking about? Sa'ad said, you remember when I said salam to you? Uthman said, I don't remember that, you never said salam to me. Sa'ad said, you remember when I came to you in, in this place and at that time and I said salam wa alaykum to you? And he said, no, I don't remember it. And eventually, after speaking amongst themselves, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu picked up and he remembered. And he said to Sa'ad, I remember now. And he started to apologize to him. 
And he told them, I was so deeply engrossed in a thought, trying to remember something, that I forgot to even say wa alaykum as salam to you. You know when someone, you know, we, it's called the zombie generation. You know, if you really want to get something out of your kids, ask them to do something for you while they're sitting down watching TV or while they're on the computer behind their Facebook. They will answer you. Same thing with your parents, by the way. If you want to get something out of your parents, <laughs> just wait till they're sitting glued to a screen. And husbands and wives too. You know, if, if your husband's a little stingy, just go to your husband whenever he's glued to the screen and be like, hey, can I get uh, $2,000? I need to buy something. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Just leave me alone. <laughs> I'm busy. That's not what these people were thinking about. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I was trying to remember a dua that the Prophet wasallam taught us to say in our times of hardship. The best dua. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, I will tell you what that dua is. He said, I remember when we were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Shall I not tell you what the best dua to say in your times of hardship is? And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, there came a Bedouin and interrupted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and started talking to him about something else. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never told them the dua. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got distracted. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was reminding Uthman of that gathering. And then the Prophet sallallahu got up and went home. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, I followed the Prophet sallallahu home, but I kept the distance because I didn't want to bother him. And he said, I was hoping he'd, he'd notice me behind him. And just as he was about to enter his house, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, I started to make some noises. I started to stomp my feet a little bit, <clears throat> clear my throat, make some kind of noises so that he noticed I was right behind him. Then the Prophet ﷺ turned around and he said, What is it, O Sa'ad? Is there something that you need? Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, you never finished telling us what the dua was. And Rasulullah said, The best dua to say at your time of hardship is what? The dua of Yunus alayhi salam. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al That there is no God worthy of worship or unconditional obedience except for you. How perfect are you and how imperfect am I? I was from the transgressors. Verily, I was from the transgressors. Can you imagine? SubhanAllah. The dua that Yunus alayhi salam made from the stomach of a whale. Talk about an awkward place to make dua, right? The stomach of a whale and calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I don't think anyone's ever called you from here before. You know, someone might have called you from, from, from you know, at a time of war, in, in, some, in, in some gutters, in, you know, somewhere. People have called you from all different places. But Yunus alayhi salam was calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the darkness of the stomach of a whale. But that dua contained an acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfection. And an acknowledgement of his own imperfection. You know what it meant? Oh Allah, I'm ready to trust you. SubhanAllah, think about it. Yunus alayhi salam, and obviously Yunus alayhi salam never lost tawakkul, but Yunus alayhi salam gave up temporarily. And when he called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that dua, it was an expression of confidence and trust. I messed up, I'm ready to trust you. I trust you, O oh Allah. You are perfect, I am imperfect. That's from the Qur'an. Can you imagine that a man was saying that from the stomach of a whale, and 1400 years later, somewhere in the world, someone is reciting the dua of Yunus alayhi salam. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the dua of Yunus alayhi salam as a gift. Likewise, Zakariya alayhi salam, إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَّ When he shouted upon, he shouted to his Lord, he cried a cry that was silent. إِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْعُونَ أَصَمًّا وَلَا غَائِبًا As the Prophet ﷺ said, you're not calling upon one who is or absent with a silent prayer that was so sincere that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed that dua for the benefit of mankind, for the benefit of everyone to come for thousands of years to read the dua of Zakaria alayhi salam, to look at what he called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. Dear brothers and sisters, this shows you again, the Quran is meant to be there for us as a, as a cure 
a cure for distress, a cure for harm. And it heals the ailments of society when we trust the guidance of the Qur'an. But whenever you have that hesitation towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wallah, you know when people tell me I don't feel prayer in my heart, I don't feel it in my heart whenever I'm praying. Well, what have you filled your heart with for the last 20 years? That's really what the question should be. What have you been putting in your heart for the last 20 years? If you've been putting in it what Ibn Abbas was putting in it, then the reaction from it will be what Ibn Abbas gave. And you really want to know how beautiful the Qur'an is and how much of a protection the Qur'an is? Forget, let's not talk about the Sahaba and the Prophets for a moment. How many of you have heard of the name Umar al-Ashqar? Shaykh Umar al-Ashqar, raise your hand. Rahimahullah ta'ala, maybe some of you have read his book on Islamic Creed, his series on Islamic Creed. A very beautiful series on Islamic Creed, prob probably the best in English. Summarizing the different forms of aqidah, the different pillars of iman. Shaykh Umar al-Asqar rahimahullah ta'ala is a beloved teacher of mine. He passed away the previous Ramadan of last year, not this year. Rahimahullah ta'ala. His brother Muhammad al-Asqar was a great scholar in fiqh also, jurisprudence. And he tells the story about his mother. His mother was illiterate at the age of seven years old. Now if you guys aren't paying attention, just pay attention to this part. Seventy years old, she's illiterate, she can't read or write, and she comes to her kids and she says to her kids, I want to learn how to read Qur'an and I want to memorize it. <laughs> Can you imagine a seventy-year-old that knows how to read saying, I'm going to memorize the Qur'an? It's pretty extraordinary, right? You know, the older you get, the more difficult it gets, right? I mean, usually, and by the way, when we talk about sincerity with the Qur'an, I'm going to give you guys a little secret. You know, you really want to test your ikhlas and being a student of knowledge, go memorize the Qur'an as an adult. You know why? Because most of the huffad around the world are huffad because their parents put them in madrasas when they were kids, right or wrong. Very rarely will you find someone that goes and memorizes the Qur'an as an adult. It's extremely rare. Usually, you know, mashallah, someone had good parents and they were fortunate to have good parents that put them, that filled their brains and filled their hearts with that at a young age. But very rarely will you find an adult. Why? Because when you're an adult, it's not impressive. You can't be in a gathering and say, hey, look, guys, you want to hear me recite Surah al bayina How about Surah al naba When you're a kid, your parents will say, hey, you know, look, my son can recite Surah Al-Shams. Go ahead. You know, and if you're like me, I have to always say, my daughter doesn't know how to recite this, and then she'll start reciting it. You know, challenge her, reverse psychology. That's the only way I can make my daughter recite Qur'an, is tell her, you don't know how to read. <laughs> then she'll read. But when you're a kid, then everyone is like, you know, your parents are proud of you. But as an adult, no, I want to know some hadith now, I want to know some fiqh, I want to know an odd story that people don't know about, that I can impress people with. Right? I want to be able to talk about Dajjal. I want to be able to talk about the jinn. It's impressive in a gathering to be able to quote something odd, to be able to quote a strange hadith. And you know the Salaf used to say, if you seek out strange stories, then you have a strange heart. You know, people seek out those types of things because as an adult it's impressive to know some fiqh, to be able to talk people down. But really, hifd al-Qur'an, when you get older, it's kind of irrelevant. It takes a lot of ikhlas, it takes a lot of sincerity. This woman is 70 years old and tells her kids, I want to memorize the Qur'an now. And I'm illiterate, so teach me how to read. So they first taught her to read the word Allah. So they would read the Qur'an to her and she would follow along and when she would see Allah, she'd get excited. Say, there it is. She knew how to recognize Allah. Then they taught her the name of the Prophet ﷺ. Then they taught her how to read the Shahada. Then they taught her, Inna ladina amanu. Then they started to teach her some of the frequent phrases in the Qur'an. And she kept on catching on and catching on and catching on. She'd be so excited when she recognized what she was reading. Once she learned how to read, she started her memorization. Now I'm not going to tell you she memorized the Qur'an in one year. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say that this woman started off at the age of seven years old, learning how to read and memorize the Qur'an at the age of 75 years old. SubhanAllah. A 75 year old woman memorized the Qur'an. And you know what? There is nothing sweeter 
You know, because the recitation of the Qur'an in and of itself, this is a narration from Ahmad rahimahullah also, the very famous dream that he had, where he asked his creator, should a person read the Qur'an without understanding, even if they don't understand it yet? Yes, they should, but they should learn understanding simultaneously. Dear brothers and sisters, how many of you are Hafad in here? Raise your hands, please. I want to see some hands. How many of you memorize the Qur'an in here? And Mashayikh, I know. <laughs> you memorize the Qur'an? You're the man. MashaAllah. Any of you who have memorized the Qur'an know that the sweetest moments of your life is when you come to Surah An-Nas for the time when you finish your khitam, your first khitam of Qur'an, your first completion of the Qur'an. When you have finished memorizing the Qur'an and you're reading Surah An-Nas. It is such an emotional moment. It is such, a, it, it is such an amazing moment because you realize that you've just finished over 600 pages of memorization and you're coming to Surah An-Nas. And SubhanAllah, I've seen people whenever they're finishing their memorization of the Qur'an, when they're reading Surah An-Nas, they can't even get through it. And you know, Shaykh Umar al-Ashqar, he said that his mother took longer to read Surah An-Nas than she took to read Surah Al-Baqarah. Because of how emotional she was. Just the recitation of the Qur'an. Just being a companion of the Qur'an is a relief of your heart. Wallahi, just having its recitation always playing, just always being around it, just always you know, occupying yourself with the Qur'an is a relief in and of itself. When you can add on to that a trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a willingness to submit yourself intellectually, spiritually, submit your brain and submit your heart, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make the Qur'an the reliever of your distress, that's when you become from Ahlul Qur'an. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you and I, all of us from Ahlul Qur'an. Allahumma ameen. And dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet sallallahu did not fear, you know, the degeneration of the ummah would not be when people stop reading Qur'an. It's whenever they stop when they stop reflecting on the Qur'an and when they stop looking to the Qur'an for what it should be as a book of guidance. And the famous hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet sallallahu wasn't afraid that people will stop being huffad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I'm afraid that a person would memorize the Qur'an and he's reciting it. But again, because of his lack of understanding, he will take a sword as a result to his neighbor and hold the sword upon him, accusing him of being a kafir. Accusing him of being a disbeliever. Meaning what? He didn't take guidance from it, he didn't take mercy from it, he took harshness. He took the opposite from it. And he's accusing his neighbor of kufr because of his recitation of the Qur'an, but of his lack of understanding of the Qur'an. And Hudayfa said, Ya Rasulullah, who's closer to shirk? The one who's making the accusation or the accused? And the Prophet ﷺ said, the accuser is closer to shirk. So it's again, it's a lack of understanding also. And we need to first approach its recitation, and then we need to start to simultaneously learn to appreciate and trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what He has given us with those stories. And I'll leave you guys with a little bit of a funny story. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, because since we're talking about people who didn't understand the Qur'an and these extremists and things of that sort. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah had a very interesting encounter with the Khawarij. The Khawarij were these people who used to recite the Qur'an to a point that their eyes would become red. They were like buzzing bees. But again, it wouldn't go past their throats. It wouldn't go to their hearts. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, they used to hate him. They wanted to kill him. So they came to him one day when he was traveling with a caravan. And they told him that, you know, they wanted, to, they, they were coming to him to accuse him of kufr. They asked him some questions. They were trying to kill him. And Imam Hanifa rahimahullah said, we seek protection. We seek protection. All of a sudden, these people started to, to, to surround Imam Hanifa rahimahullah in his caravan. And they walked with him, reciting Quran upon him, escorting him to his home. They told him what happened. And he said, well, you know, they consider me to be kafir. They consider me to be a disbeliever. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that if the disbelievers seek protection, then recite upon them and escort them to safety. So he used it against them. <laughs> and instead of being killed, he actually had them escort him and his, and his caravan to his home. Dear brothers and sisters, the point is honestly, wallahi, I'm challenging each and every single one of you. And this is, this is you know, a practical step from this convention. Find a Qur'an buddy. 
Find the Qur'an, buddy. Start memorizing together, even if it's a few ayat a day. Read, reflect, acquaint yourself with the tafsir of the Qur'an, and make sure that when you open the Qur'an to start reading it, you're reading it as a personalized letter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of Qur'an. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaykum wa